For those of you who I don't know and perhaps haven't met before in previous years, my name is Mr Stones. I'm currently deputy head teacher here with uh, with specific responsibility for curriculum and assessment. And, and of course, the year nine options program um, is a really significant part of our curriculum offer. I will also be joined um, tonight um, in 15, 20 minutes or so by Dr Jackson, who is head of year nine. And together, what we want to try and do um, over the course of about 40 minutes or so is steer you through the year nine options program so that you understand a little bit more about how that process will work. I did want to start off this evening um, by uh, by just apologising that we're not meeting you face to face. It was a really difficult decision. It's always lovely to meet people uh, to meet people face to face and to get people into the school. Um, but just in, in recognition of some of the feedback that we had received, and um, particularly for those people travelling from coastal areas, we were just concerned that the weather would prevent people from attending. So I do hope you don't mind. Um, I hope you're able to come along to this to this remotely if you would have been here face to face. Um, but but certainly I hope you appreciate our reasons for doing that, just in the interest of trying to get as many people to hear these key messages as is uh, as is possible. So I want to start off um, just with with a little bit about our starting point for curriculum, our starting point for year nine options. And I particularly want to look at the second statement here on our vision and intent to develop a love of learning and to achieve the best possible outcomes for all students and both of those are only possible if we have a well constructed options program that meets the needs and preferences of the majority of students in that cohort. And that's what myself and Dr Jackson will go through with you this evening, um, just so that you understand how we make that possible. So this document that you see on the screen in front of you, I'm hoping this isn't the first time you've seen this. This is a screenshot of our options booklet, which was printed uh, as a hard copy and distributed to all students in the year group um, approximately the middle of December or so, so that these conversations about the options programme, about the options process, could begin in good time for where we find ourselves this month. And of course, it's a pertinent time for us to pick up that conversation because year nine students are now going through the process of making those options choices ready for, uh, ready for entry into year 10 in September. Everything I'm going to share with you tonight, including a digital copy of that options booklet, um, can be found on our website. So if you go to the Norton College homepage, up at the top, you will see an option, a little tab on the ribbon that says curriculum. And if you click on curriculum, that will take you to a key stage three, four and five page. And all of our options information is within the key stage four area. So again, you'll be able to find a copy of that options booklet there if you haven't already seen it but it is a really important resource if you could please make sure you have access to it because it includes information about all of the different subjects that we have on offer here now one of the really difficult things um, in fact one of the very difficult things whenever you're talking to uh, to to parents and carers in the local community is that some people will be very close to uh, to sort of the daily operations of schools in terms of gcses and how gcses are structured and how they're graded um, and actually for other people, they might be a little bit more distant. They might not have had um, another child come through GCSEs. Um, the child in year nine might not have any siblings who've done GCSEs, whereas for other people, that's not always the case. So I do apologise in advance if I'm sharing information with you that you know, because you might have another child already in year 10 and not a lot has changed. But equally, you might not be in that position. So it is important that I take just a few moments this evening to share that information with you. And again, I don't want to be apologetic for that because there are some very, uh, very significant key messages that I need to make sure we communicate. So going back a few years, um, the vast majority of GCSEs were reformed. The whole system changed. And people don't really refer to it as a new system, new GCSEs anymore, because this system's now been in place for six or seven years. But actually, for lots of people, they don't understand what changed. So that's why we still refer to it as a new system. And that new GCSE system means that um, the vast majority of qualifications studied in year 10 and 11 are now graded on a numerical scale of nine to one, with nine the top grade and one um, one the at uh, the other end of the scale, rather than the A star to G that certainly I remember, I know many of you will remember, that system does not exist at GCSE anymore. Most qualifications are nine to one. We don't have a strategy at all on any qualifications at GCSE. Unhelpfully, we do still have some of those lettered grades at A-level, but we're just talking about GCSE this evening. 
one of the main driving principles of those new GCSEs is that they are assessed mainly by examination. And those examinations, largely speaking, all take place at the end of the two year programme. So at the end of year 11. All of the courses that we offer students for entry into year 10 are designed for two years of study. They're not they're not divided up into different modules. You can't take, you know, a January exam in year 10 and then think, oh, I've done one of my four modules. You can't take something at the end of year 10 and think, oh, I've done half of my GCSE assessment. In most cases, all of those subjects, are, all of those exams are taken at the end of year 11. And all students within a subject will sit the same exam apart from a couple of um, instances where we have a foundation tier and a higher tier. And I'm going to share with you which subjects that applies to and why that system exists. So the new scale runs from nine to one. Nine is the highest grade. People broadly think about a grade four and a five as a standard pass and a strong pass. We get lots of questions about, well, what's a grade nine in old money? Is a grade nine an A star? Is a grade eight an A star? And it's quite unhelpful to make those comparisons because there is no proper comparison between the two in terms of just being able to say a nine is this, an eight is this, a seven is this, because there are more points on the new system than there were on the old system. So you can't just copy them, you can't just copy them across like that. But broadly speaking, generally speaking, a grade four and a grade five are seen as a standard and a strong pass. And you can see here, this is quite helpful um, to, to sort of see the relationship between those two. So you've got the uh, numerical grades on the left hand side that apply to the current GCSEs and the old system on the right hand side. But you'll see here exactly why it's problematic. A like grade nine, eight and seven, the same number of students getting those will be those who got an A star and the top third of an A. And then there's broadly a relationship between four, five, six and the grades B and C. And then at the bottom end, D to G and one to three. But you can see they're not in exactly the same place there. So we just need to bear that in mind. The, the important thing is that the broadly speaking, the same proportion of students who achieve a grade seven and above, so seven, eight and nine, and um, that's broadly equal to those who would have achieved a grade A and above. So that helps you draw some, some conclusions about the relationship between these grades. So most of the subjects that we offer students as they enter year 10 are GCSE subjects. And that means that at the end of year 11, when they sit those exams, they will then get their grade and they will have a GCSE in that subject. But there are a number of qualifications that we offer that are considered non GCSE subjects. They still carry the same weight as a GCSE. They are still worth one GCSE. They are recognised as the equivalent of a GCSE. But strictly speaking, they're not GCSEs. We refer to these qualifications as um, WJEC awards, BTECs or Cambridge Nationals, um, according to which the exam board is Pearson, AQA or OCR. So students in year 10 and 11 can choose some non GCSE subjects. The big difference between these um, subjects and GCSE subjects is that there is normally some form of internal assessment that you can do between now and the end of year 11 that actually contributes towards your final grade. So if you do um, WJEC award food, for example, there will be some sort of practical project that you can complete before the end of year 11 that might be worth 30% of your final grade. If you choose performing arts, there is a practical performance or some sort of practical component that again contributes towards your final grade. In Cambridge National Sports Science, again, you will complete two internally assessed pieces of work, coursework, that make up for about 60% of your grade. That's the main difference between GCSEs and non GCSEs. However, non GCSEs, so the, the qualifications we're looking at here, WJEC Awards, BTEX, Cambridge Nationals, the Department for Education has been very clear that in order to ensure that those subjects remain vigorous, there is still always an element of external assessment, and that normally is at the end of year 11. So although that subject might not be assessed exclusively at the end of year 11, there is normally still some form of assessment that takes place at that point. And these qualifications are not graded 9 down to 1. They're also not graded A star down to G, and as, as I said a few moments ago, that system is completely gone. 
Instead, these subjects are graded um, on a level two distinction down to a level one pass system. And you can see here on the right hand side, we have a level two distinction star, which is the top grade on those non GCSEs, then a level two distinction, a level two merit, a level two pass. So they're broadly equivalent to grades four to nine. Then we have a level one distinction, a level one merit and a level one pass. So in terms of your, your subjects and the choices that you'll make, you're looking at the grades down the middle and the grades on the right hand side. So in terms of the options themselves and the subjects that are available to you, um, there are there's some degree of optionality. Of course, you would expect that because it's called an options process, but there are also some things that all students will study across the cohort. And I'm going to start off with those and then move into those bits that are optional. So English, maths and science, as you would expect, all students will study those subjects. Uh, when I talk about English, I'm talking about English language and English literature. They are two separate GCSEs. So students will do maths, science, English language and English literature. Students by default will be expected to do double science, which gives them two GCSE grades. So they might come out with four, four, five, five, six, six and so on. But there is also an opportunity for some students to do triple science, which gives them three separate GCSEs, physics, biology and chemistry, rather than double science, which still allow students to study the three sciences, but they do it within two GCSEs. Triple science is three separate GCSEs, and because it's an extra GCSE, it takes one slot from the options that we will look at later on. Please don't confuse that. There have been lots of people in the past thinking that you choose double science or triple science and it doesn't affect your options. That's not true. If you do triple science, then that counts as one of your options because it takes an extra five hours per fortnight. And in science, um, regardless of whether you do double or triple, your subject teachers will support you and work with you to determine whether or not you are entered for higher tier or foundation tier. Higher tier is grades nine to four and foundation tier is grades five to one. And again, double and triple science are both assessed by exams at the end of year 11. There's nothing done in year 10 or throughout year 11. Everything is at the end. In addition to maths, English and science, many of our students will study in addition to those three French and then also humanity, so history or geography. And in fact, some students do history and geography. And that for many students is the core offer. The things beyond that are the things that we refer to as options. And I'm going to come on to those in a few slides. But when we look at this combination of subjects on the screen, maths, English, science, French, and history and our geography. You'll recall that I wrote to you recently to give you a little bit of information about this. And I said that as part of our options process this year, we were looking to introduce pathways which would help a student determine their choice of subjects. Now, for lots of reasons, that's not quite as straightforward as it sounds. Um, and some students might be very good at some subjects and, and more concerned about others. And we've listened to all of that feedback and we need to make sure that any changes that we make are introduced at the right time. And um, we don't want too big a change for the students in the cohort if it isn't the right change for them at that time. So although we absolutely strongly recommend French, um, certainly for, for the majority of our students here, we have changed that pathway model, which was the one that we wrote to you recently about. And now we have that strong recommendation in place that students study French as one of their options. Why do we recommend uh, a humanities subject, history and our geography? And in fact, all students have to do history or geography. And why do we so strongly recommend French? Are two questions that we receive all of the time. They're very, very common questions that we that we get asked. And there are lots of ways to answer those questions. And um, there are um, the, the, the school has has lots of uh, lots of value that it places in those subjects. There is lots of national evidence that there is value placed in those subjects. The Department for Education has its own evidence base, and I don't want to abdicate and, and pass on responsibilities to other organisations, but instead I want to start with the value that Norton College places in those subjects. And we know that young people nationally have to compete for jobs. And when those young people are competing for jobs, we want them to be in the very best place possible. And to get them into the very best place possible, we want them to have a rigorous combination of GCSEs. And that is widely regarded as a GCSE curriculum that includes 
history or geography and French and those subjects alongside English, maths and science. There are lots of additional um, additional comments and points and pieces of research that we can link to, but the underpinning principle is that we want students to have a broad and balanced curriculum, however we present that and whatever statistics we refer we refer you to. The underpinning principle is that we want a broad and balanced curriculum that includes those subjects. And additionally, um, another question that I, I get asked quite a lot is, well, I, I don't like some of those subjects, so why would I want to study them? And again, it comes back to breadth and balance. The purpose of a GCSE programme of study is not to specialise in a single subject area that you have a real interest in. Instead, the purpose of a GCSE programme is to give you an experience of studying a wide breadth of subjects. It is not designed to allow you to specialise. And that's why you do maths, English and science. That's why you do history or geography. That's why many of you will do French. It's about how those subjects work together to give you an exposure within key stage four, year 10 and 11. So it's not about an individual subject, but rather the rigorous combination of those different subjects that are available to you. And the most rigorous measure, as, de as determined by the Department for Education, is referred to as the English Baccalaureate, or the EBAC for short. And the DfE, lots of employers, lots of universities, the careers, um, the, the, the careers consultants that we work with, We'll all refer to this EBAC, you'll hear it in conversation. It's seen to be a measure of what a broad and balanced curriculum is. And the EBAC, for students to get the EBAC, it's not a qualification in itself, it's not an extra GCSE, but it simply means that you could say that my GCSEs gave me access to the EBAC, or I'm EBAC eligible. And those people who are EBAC eligible are those young people who do English and maths, which everybody here will do, two sciences, double science, which everybody here will do, or triple science if you upgrade to that, a modern foreign language, and then a humanity, geography or history. And again, everybody will do geography or history. So for many people, French is the only subject that they're not doing that, if they did do, would give them access to the EBAC to make sure that they've got that full breadth of subjects. And our option blocks have been created to allow students to study those those subjects should they want to. And we know that for many of our students, that is the right combination. Interestingly as well, the research is very clear that, um, that when you study the EBAC, so that would include that range of subjects that I've just shared with you, it helps to improve a young person's performance in English and maths. And that goes back very much to what I was just saying about the fact that we cannot look at these subjects in isolation. You're not specialising in a subject family or a subject discipline at the moment, but rather studying a range, a combination of GCSEs when seen together, which allows you to learn more broadly across that range of subjects. I also get lots of comments passed to me um, which say things like, in fact, it's not fair to say I just see these in French, I see them in maths as well. Lots of people say to me things like, I don't like maths, I've never liked maths. I don't like French, I've never liked French, I'm no good at French, I'm no good at maths. We hear those comments lots and lots. And in many cases, that's not necessarily true. People feel they're not very good at them because they're hard subjects. But actually, quite often, the achievement data that we have from year seven, eight and nine might paint a very different picture. So that's the first thing to bear in mind when you think that you're not very good at something. But secondly, the government has listened to those concerns and it recognises that people find GCSE French or any modern foreign language very, very difficult. And that's why the government has now confirmed its plans to change the modern foreign language GCSEs to make the content more accessible. And that is a really significant step forward because it means that French as a GCSE is now accessible to all students in the cohort. And that really is a very significant change that we must not lose sight of. The government expects that 90% of students will do that combination of subjects by 2025. And although we're not determining who those 90% are and saying, right, you have to do this because we want to, uh, we, we want to take account of students' preferences and interests as part of this process, what we must not lose sight of is the fact that we are absolutely united in strongly recommending that students take the EBAC and they would be either recommended to or expected to wherever they went. That's not just something that we value as a school. And we don't abdicate the Department for Education, but we do agree with them that this combination of subjects is the right one. So I've said a lot there about principles in terms of subjects and the curriculum offer and how all of those different options fit together. 
and you will most likely now be sat there thinking, so what happens next? What will my son or daughter be asked to do next as part of this process? And I'm going to hand over to Dr Jackson, who's going to take you through some of those logistics so that you understand what those next steps will look like. Thank you very so much for your time, Dr Jackson. Good evening. So the first thing we have to think about is I'm going to take you through some of the process that's going to happen at, at Norton over the next couple of months. The first thing we have to think about is what can you do? What can you do to support the options process and to help your son or daughter? So there's a number of questions that we can think about and discuss. But the first thing to reinforce what uh, Mr Stone said is, looking at the details of the information in the options booklet. You've got access to the paper copy from your son or daughter, but you've also, Mr Stones, indicated how you can access that online through the school website. So the first thing we think about is what subjects does your son or daughter enjoy studying? So what we really want to do is to encourage you to start a discussion with them so that you come to the right conclusion at the time that you have to make the option choices. You can think about um, the subjects that they might enjoy. Um, the sort of thing you could look at is you can look at the report from the parents, the parents um, report that was submitted to you this week. We've got the parents evening tomorrow night. So that involves some conversation with teachers. Um, students should be talking to their peers about what subjects they enjoy and where they think they're going to go with them. You could also think about um, that they achieve well in. Again, that will be indicated in the report and that will come across tomorrow night with the discussion with their different teachers. Um, do they want to study something new? Well, do they have interests outside school? Do they have hobbies? For example, it might be with animals, so they might be interested in selecting the animal care and the farm choice. It might be that they're interested in some particular sports and so they've been interested in the sports choice. So hobbies and interests outside school can also influence some of the options that they might take. It's also important to think about where they might be going in the future. What career aspirations do they have? Are they interested in going to higher education and going to university? You know, what sort of path might they want to take? Now that will be influenced obviously by sometimes their academic but also the personal interests of the sort of job they would like to do in the future. So what you can do is we can look ahead at the next step of their education, look ahead beyond even Norton College to what they might be interested in and to where their career might be taking them. Um, it's really important that we don't just base our options on friendship. So they shouldn't really be choosing subjects that they think their friends are going to go. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a group of friends. We have found in the past that this is really short sighted. As we know, friendships can change, but also GCSEs are over a two year period. They are hard work and just to base that in friendships can be a bit thin and can lead to trouble in the future. So. Just to reinforce what Mr Stones was saying, um, and that is the importance of having a broad and balanced curriculum. And for that, we want to encourage, if possible, that they do study French, in particular, if they are in sets one and two of English and French. Um, so it's not just we mentioned before about just doing the same as friends, and it shouldn't be just about the teachers they like. Now that can be an influence in the selection that we make, but as you know, we cannot guarantee that a teacher that a student likes to work with or likes to be in the classroom is going to be here at Norton for the full duration of the course. There is some websites here that you can look at for more information. So for example, apprenticeships, if we think that your son or daughter might be more interested in the practical nature and not um, classroom study based. Um, UCAS, if you're interested in further application to maybe university. But the website I would like to just show you some information from is called Career Pilot. And I think that's a very, it's a very nice level for year nine students to understand and for you to 
um, develop some sort of discussion with them about the content. So if we look at one of the links, it, it starts to break up different jobs by different sectors. So it might be business, is it agriculture, could be healthcare, education. So it starts to select um, where potential careers might emerge of areas that they are interested in. It also allows you to do a skills audit so you can work out what particular skills they've got. For example, are they creative? Um, do they like to help and support people? Um, do they want the freedom to work where they want and when they want? Um, maybe they want to make sure that they are developing practical skills. Maybe they want to earn lots of money. Um, do they want to work for themselves? Or for example, do they want maybe to use their autism talents to be valued in that place of work? Um, what we can do is um, I would recommend that you look at this information and so that will lead to further discussions. Um, we can look at um, job sectors, values and those skills that I've mentioned. But another area that we can look at is subjects. And so if you look at subjects, you'll get something like this, which breaks down into the different GCSEs that, that they can choose. So you can start to look in great detail at individual subjects and to see if they are maybe suitable for the option choices. So here I've selected business just as an example, as the studies. And what you can see is um, they list jobs in different ways. So they'll should talk about jobs that are directly related to business studies, ones that are maybe slightly related but involve the same sort of skills. Um, then if your son or daughter is interested in practical nature, how can apprenticeships link to business studies, its vocational courses, and then it moves on to even talking about different degrees and the jobs that that might relate to. So there's a lot of information that should just engage with your son or daughters to start discussions to try and get from them what they may be interested in studying. And down the bottom, you can see I've just shown the, the start of a list, but there's a long list of, of jobs in particular jobs that that they might want to study or they might want to select as the careers and it details things like um, salaries and um, particular tasks that are involved in daily um, part of that, that that job so they know exactly what's maybe going to be involved in those job areas. So there's lots of information that website's called Careers Pilot, and it gives a lot of information just about how to choose and how not to choose particular GCSE choices. So I just want to talk through the timetable that, ha that Mr Stones has developed that we are going to use at Norton College. Obviously, in December, we um, handed out the printed option booklets to students that they can look through. Now, that includes all the student, all the subjects that they could potentially choose, as well as the ones that they have to study while um, studying for the GCSEs. We carried out the assessment week in December, and obviously you have just received the report, which will give you a lot of information about different subjects and also the teacher's perception of how that student enjoys or achieves in that subject. Now that might not tally up with what your son or daughter thinks about that subject. And again, that's another potential area of discussion that you could have tomorrow night. So we get to the 17th of January, we've got the options evening, which we've got online um, to, to discuss information and guide you into the next steps that you can take so tomorrow, the parents evening is an important opportunity because that's allowing you to talk to the teachers um, and get some support and possible direction of subjects that might be suitable for your son or daughter, because you can work out how well they're achieving, how well they're doing and engaging in those subjects. It then moves on next week to um, 
information sessions. Now that will happen in lessons and individual teachers or representatives from subjects will speak to the classes and the students and they will talk through um, the possible content that would be in a course, the type of assessment, the length of the assessment and also the possible careers. But what it does allow is allow students to ask questions of those specialists about their individual subjects. We then move on to the beginning of February um, and students were, um, it, this was detailed to them in an assembly this morning, that at an earliest opportunity, once they've reviewed the information and had discussions at home, that we are going to ask what potential subjects they might want to select, what their preferences would be. Now, this will not be their final option choice. But they will do an online survey and see the students, the, the subjects that they would like to select. Now that allows Mr Stones to look at the wide breadth of subjects that they've chosen. He can look at the numbers for each subject and he can start to construct the option blocks that would allow the students to uh, select later on in the month. We then go on towards the end of February. So about the 19th of February, we will actually detail a form and that will be issued to yourselves as parents and carers, because obviously it's your responsibility to make sure that the options are selected. And we need to know that you have agreed those options that they are selecting. It's not just for the student to select them. We need the parents to be involved and you'll submit that application by the 23rd of February. So that is the deadline for the option selection. So you, you will submit your application by the 23rd of December. Following that, there will be a range of meetings with individual students and all students in year nine will receive a meeting with either myself or a membership of the leadership team. And that will allow that us to review their options, to have a final discussion and just to ensure that they, we think that they have made the correct options for their future. Because this is a, a big opportunity for them to make these choices. But obviously, once these choices have made, it's not going to be easy to change them. Once we have conducted all of those meetings and looked at the options and the numbers available, we will then write to you confirming your child's options. It was emphasised in their assembly this morning, the, the seriousness and the importance of this process, because if they make a mistake, it is not always going to be easy to come back and change the options, because for example, particular practical subjects that they might want to do, once the numbers are full, there is a ceiling on those classes for health and safety reasons. So it's really important that we make the correct decisions in the first place and not to come back and try and change them later. Obviously, we will write to you with confirming those options. Now, there has been a lot of information um, given this evening, and there's a lot of information for you to consider. Now, I think on our school website in the next day or two, this presentation will be posted as a video, so you'll be able to review it and go back over that information. If you have any particular questions, Mr Stones and myself will be at the parents' evening tomorrow night, so you will be able to ask any questions directly. If there are any other questions, either you can attend tomorrow night or you've got other questions in the future, please, if you want to address them to the admin at Norton College email address, and then we will be able to select them and reply to you. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you found this information even, uh, interesting and um, informative, and I look forward to meeting you tomorrow night. Thank you.